Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Hello, and welcome to Coffee with Closers, a podcast featuring a team of public relations professionals at Pinkston in Washington, D.C. From media personalities to pioneers in healthcare and disruptors in business, we talk with some of America's most interesting people who tell interesting stories. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get started. This is Coffee with Closers. Joining us today is Rod Griffin, Senior Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy at Experian, a leading global information services company. With more than 20 years of experience in the information services industry, Rod works with consumer advocates, financial educators, and other stakeholders to help consumers manage their personal finances and protect themselves against fraud and identity theft. With inflation at an all-time high, he offers timely advice on how consumers can best navigate this turbulent economic environment, including tips on developing and maintaining good credit while boosting credit scores. He also shares his thoughts on the state of financial literacy in the United States today. In 2016, he was named Educator of the Year by the Institute for Financial Literacy. Rod Griffin is a closer. Right. So, Rod Griffin, Senior Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian, joins us today. Rod, good afternoon. How's it going? Great. Steve Hanna, great to be here. It's fantastic. A little bit great. soggy today, but otherwise, <laughs> really good. Um, great. Well, it's great to have you. Let's just jump right in. We've got a lot to get to today. Obviously, we are meeting at a very interesting time in our history. We've got record inflation Um, A lot of statistics show that maybe we're not heading in the right direction when it comes to financial literacy. Um, I want to read you some statistics. They're pretty sobering, Rod. I think you know most of them or all of them. Um, Research shows 64% of Americans, 166 million adults living paycheck to paycheck, 33% of working Americans denied credit over the past year. 56% of Americans are unable to cover an unexpected $1,000 emergency bill. So I'm going to come in hard on this one. Uh, The list goes on. Do we have a financial literacy crisis in America? And if so, how bad is it? Um, I don't know if I would say it's a crisis. Um, There there is certainly a um, dearth of financial knowledge that we need to address. And we're, we're getting better at it. Uh, you know, I've been in the industry now 25 years, and I can tell you people are more savvy now than they were. Good. Uh, I think the internet plays a big part in that. Yep. People are able to get information, not always the best information. Uh, you know, some of the social media channels, not always the greatest source. But we're better than we were, but that's not saying a whole lot. You know, I think, mm-hmm. you know, when we look at a recent study we did uh, with Experian, we look at Gen Z, so the youngest consumers, many of them, had no idea that a credit score or credit report would affect lending decisions, for example, yeah. uh, let yep. alone you know, things like getting a cell phone uh, or getting an apartment or you know the th- kinds of things that aren't necessarily traditional credit. So we have a long way to go, um, but but we're moving in the right direction. Good. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. On that note, um, Uh, 71% of Americans, I believe this is an Experian report, you guys say that 71% of Americans said they feel their paycheck is not able to keep up with inflation. We have record inflation right now, probably the highest it's been in some 20, 30 years. Um, This could go on a long time. How best can consumers navigate this current, these choppy waters that we're experiencing today? Yeah. And, and the number I saw regarding inflation was 40 years. Uh, so yeah, it might that even be was higher when than, yeah. I was in seventh grade. Uh, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Yeah, it's uh, high. It's high. That's huge. And it really is hitting people's pocketbooks. What, what we're seeing is that it's you know, as much as $300 a month in terms of value. You know, the dollar in, in your wallet is being stretched more than ever before. Well, yep. not ever before, but since I was in junior high school. Uh, and so, you know, 
people are trying to save and they're trying to find ways to do that. You know, the common ones we hear about, you know, we're not going to go out to, to the movies. We're not going to go do things for entertainment and we're not going to eat out as much. Um, yep. You know, there might be health benefits to the not eating out as much, but uh, you know, it, 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 those help. But there are other things that people are also looking at. Like you said, it, it, you know, they're telling us that um, they're concerned that in the next few months, that their paycheck won't go far enough, uh, that they're, they're going to have budget shortfalls. So looking for bigger ways to save money is going to be even more important. Uh, yep. And, uh, you know, so there, and there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, insurance is a big one. Uh, yep. You can, we're, you know, people are telling us, for example, that they're starting to use uh, online shopping tools more, which I think is mm-hmm. very, very intelligent thing to do. Use your buying power to your advantage. Uh, but Experian has an insurance shopping service for auto insurance that will compare your rates with 40 different uh, leading providers. What we're seeing is that for people who go through that process, they're saving as much as $900 a year. Wow. So there's three months of that loss. Uh, you know, So take advantage of those kinds of tools. Uh, there are other things out there, coupons, of course. Um, I just read something, of a, kind of a fisherman, and I was reading a, a piece, for a, a person was buying a fishing boat and he did it with gift cards, <laughs> which I <laughs> thought was kind of, and when you read his reasoning, we kind of understood yeah. reasoning, it made sense. So, you know, he was looking at, they had a sale, so that saved him some money. Uh, when he, he, they didn't get points for the store credit card, but if he bought the, the gift cards, he got points or cash back for buying those gift cards. And then the sale of the boat by using the gift cards, he got points toward his card. So it was, uh, it turned out to be like several hundred dollars by by buying it with gift cards and then paying off his credit card in full, of course. So he wasn't paying interest, which I thought was pretty clever. Um, That's really interesting. So, so people are being really thoughtful about where are the savings, uh, yeah. uh, you know, and, and so, so even so far as buying a boat with gift cards. Yeah. And, and what's really, what's really interesting is what's really interesting is, is that I don't think, um, I don't think consumers really understand all that's in their toolbox to, to, to be advocates for themselves. No, I think you're right. you know, I think, you know, people don't understand that in my world, you know, working for Experian, credit reports and credit scores are something I think about every day, but yep. you know, other people don't. You know, realize if you improve your credit scores, it can help you reduce your costs for that cell phone service. It can help you reduce your costs for potentially utility service and getting it connected. It can save on security deposits if you're getting a new lease. Yep. So all of those things really contribute to having a better financial life and, and a more secure financial future. Yep. Uh, taking advantage of tools. People you know, will always look at me when I say, ask them, have you gotten your credit report? And they shake their head no and kind of put their head down and ask them why. And they're, it's because I'm afraid to see what's there. And I always tell them, well, knowing what's there is the first step in doing something about it. Right. And it can be a great financial tool. Yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah. that's really key. Using something that you don't think about as a financial tool to save money uh, in other ways is is critical. So you're right. There's a, a lot of tools in the toolbox people don't think about. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. Uh, carrying on with this inflation issue, the Federal Reserve recently raised interest rates, I believe it was a half a point. Um, for consumers, what does this mean for them in terms of their uh, borrowing power and savings power? I assume Borrowing might be a little harder. Savings might be great, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, <laughs> and and often you know the, the interest rate. You know, people understand that the Fed interest rates are interest rates charged to the banks, yep. uh, and that yep. then gets passed on to us as individuals. Eventually, it may not be right away, uh, but in the marketplace, what that means is you will see increases in your uh, cost of of credit and other resources. So. For example, right now, the average interest rate for a revolving account, a credit card, mm-hmm. is about 18% uh, for most Americans. Wow. Uh, not great, uh, but better than most parts of the world. Uh, that's likely to go up. I, you know, I've seen numbers into the 20, 22, 23% range uh, yep. as a result. So uh, you know, that's going to have a significant impact for anyone who's revolving or carrying balances month to month. Uh, yep. And I think you'll see that pass along. Mortgage rates are already seeing increases uh, and that can mean tens of thousands of dollars over the course of a mortgage uh, a repayment. So yeah, it's, it will be passed along and that's not the, it's the first 
and not likely to be the last uh, increase by the Fed to try to to tamp down inflation. But in the meantime, it's going to cost us more. Yep. Okay. Good. Interesting. Um, so once interesting, but maybe not surprising financial bright spot is that people's credit scores went up and debt went down during COVID. Um, Experian data showed that the average FICO score in the U.S. rose to 714 in 2021, which was the fourth consecutive year of an increase. Um, does evidence suggest that the pandemic-induced financial discipline could be waning given inflation, or are there some positive trends we're seeing emerging from post-pandemic world? I think it was interesting to watch with the pandemic. Uh, you know, I was around when the mortgage crashed in 2002, 2007, 2008, Time frame and and scores plummeted because people's people were over leveraged. Uh, when the pandemic started, we saw several things. Uh, one, savings rates went up right away. So when things yeah. began to be announced in February of of twenty what nineteen, um, we saw savings rates within a couple of months going up, and we saw credit card spending going down. The result was. An in, a, a decrease in utilization uh, and an increase in credit scores. Uh, I think some of the uh, government uh, uh, stimulus uh, helped. People were using it to pay down their debts rather than buying stuff. Uh, I think that's a smart consumer move. Mm -hmm. um, not sure that it was motivated by the fact that they were thinking about you know, contributing to the economy, but rather how do I protect myself as this goes on? Um, we're starting to see that turn a bit and it, it may be some retail therapy, I think in some cases, you know, people are finally out getting to spend a bit more. It feels good. Science shows that those endorphins kick in and, and there's a, a temporary, at least um, positive sense. And then you get the bill and that goes away. But, <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're seeing, seeing some of that. Um, Scores have been going up, and I and it's, I think, indicative of, of people's knowledge that the majority of people now realize that credit scores and managing their debts is important. Um, when times are good, we see them kind of fluctuate down. When things are now stressful, um, we're actually seeing behaviors change pretty quickly, and I think I think that's a positive. Um, we're in sort of unprecedented times at the moment. I think that's going to be hard to tell exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, your credit report, your financial report card, as the saying goes, um, how do you, how do you maintain a good credit? You said in an interview previously, um, that in addition to creating and sticking to a budget, it pays to be boring and consistent. And just to say no, um, especially for young people trying to build credit, what's the best way to do that? Yeah. Well, there's several things. Um, Experian is working really hard at helping people establish a credit history, uh, particularly for credit invisibles. So there are about 29 million people who are credit invisible. It means they have no credit history at all, which is a tremendous barrier to accessing low cost traditional kinds of, of credit relationships. So if you enroll in our mobile app, and you have no credit history, we'll ask you some questions about your identity. You can take a selfie and a picture of a government uh, ID, and we can create a credit report for you. It's a live selfie, not just a picture. You have to wink or smile or nod your head so that we know <laughs> you are a living being. And we can create a credit report. So that's kind of step one, uh, for especially for young people. Uh, from there or new immigrants to the, to the country, people who've had issues and have no credit history, those sorts of things, really important to helping people gain access to uh, the, the traditional financial marketplace. Several years ago, about three years ago now, we also introduced something called Experian Boost that lets you add your positive cell phone payments, your positive utility payments, your positive streaming services to your credit report. Because those companies, telecom companies, utility companies, uh, didn't report positive information to the credit bureaus. Mm -hmm. And so, if you didn't pay those bills, you might see a collection account and it could hurt your credit history. But if you're paying them on time, you didn't, terrible pun, you didn't get credit where credit was due. And so we did about three years of research and found that people who are paying those kinds of bills on time, but don't have traditional credit are actually better credit risks than the, it might indicate in their credit history. 
And so we're able to enable people to proactively add that information uh, just by going to experience.com slash boost takes about five minutes. We give them a free credit report and score at the beginning and at the end. Two out of three people are telling us they're seeing a, a, an increase in their FICO scores, typically of a, on a, well, on average, of about 12 to 13 points. Uh, for a person with what we call a thin credit file, a file of fewer than five credit accounts, it's more like 19 points. And as a result, it gets their foot in the door and helps move them in the right direction. So that's kind of step one, or actually step two. So you can create a credit report and then have positive information reported that wouldn't and we're really working to empower people to have financial success uh, and not rely necessarily on uh, information being reported by their lenders and others uh, initially, especially. And real quick on that point, Rod, do you have to have a special, uh, is there a special qualification to sign up for Boost or is it for anybody that, that wants to add those kind of uh, bills? Uh, um, the only special qualification is internet access, I suppose, um, which most of us have, or a cell phone. Uh, and uh, all you have to do is go to experience.com slash boost and follow the instructions. So if you have a cell phone bill uh, and a utility bill, natural gas, water, electricity, uh, or a streaming service like Netflix or Hulu, you tell us, here's the account I pay that through. And I want to add each of those as an account, we would add three different accounts to your credit report. Wow. We'll capture up to two years of, of history. And then each month we're able to then capture that payment and add it as a positive payment to each of those accounts. And uh, you know, we're seeing, again, we're seeing those, those scores improve um, as a result. Uh, and it's reflect, it doesn't, the other thing people say is, well, will it artificially skew scores for people who shouldn't have good credit scores? The answer to that is no, mm -hmm. because the negative information, if they have late payments collection accounts, that offsets anything that you would see from Boost. And so we don't see it uh, causing people who shouldn't be qualified to be qualified, but people who should actually able to then gain access. So uh, it's, it's really been a powerful tool. I want to talk a little bit about some of the myths around credit scores and credit reports. Um, some people think that, you know, having a bad score will hurt their employment chances, which, but I understand is not true. Um, right. What are some of the common misconceptions, maybe some new ones, I don't know, where consumers yeah. might just not know that, like, you know, your credit score, your credit history will not impact yeah. your life in this way. Yeah. How long do we have? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> go on for hours. Yeah, um, no, no, just uh, maybe give us the give us the top three. Yeah, so I think you hit on a key one: uh, yeah. employment. You know, I see all the time in in the sadly in the media um, that if you if that your credit score will affect your ability to get a job. That's simply not true. Employers never get credit scores. Yep. Uh, employers will get a limited version of your credit report that excludes anything that would violate the Equal Employment Opportunity Act. So we, we strip out anything um, you know, around age or um, you know, marital status or any of those kinds of things. We show your contact, your, your identity information. Uh, so name, address, social security, and those sorts of things. We show uh, account information, are you, what your accounts are, are you paying them on time? We don't include account numbers. So it's what we call a truncated credit report. We see that used for two reasons. One is you're managing the company's money in some way. So if you're going to be an accountant for a company, it kind of makes sense. It's a financial decision. Yep. The other is actually for identity verification and employment fraud prevention. So but I'm in Texas and in Houston, they have chemical plants. They will use credit reports to match the identifying information to the application mm -hmm. or the resume because they want to make sure you are who you say you are and you're not someone trying to gain access to a dangerous chemical that could use be used to do harm to the public. Oh, wow. So those are the, the two reasons primarily uh, that we see them used. It kind of makes sense when you think of it uh, yep. in those terms. Um, so that's one key one. They never get a credit score. Uh, employers don't. Um, getting your own credit report will hurt your credit score. Doesn't. Um, huge myth. Uh, you can get your own credit report as often as you like. It won't affect lending decisions. Uh, there are those things called inquiries yep. uh, that are simply a record that someone's looked at your report now, and so you only see what we call soft inquiries when you get your own report. It only shows to you. Um, same thing's true for pre-approved credit offers, insurance, employment. 
uh, they have no effect on, on credit scores. Um, another big myth is that when you apply for credit, it's going to wreck your credit scores. It won't. Uh, there are what we call those inquiries, what we call hard inquiries. They're the least important factor in credit scores. And so mm -hmm. I was, you know, hear people saying, um, you know, don't, want, don't let them send out your credit report to multiple lenders if you're shopping for a car uh, because it'll hurt your credit scores. It won't. Uh, when they do what we call shotgunning, scoring systems recognize you're shopping to, for the best terms for a car or house, same thing's true with mortgage lending, uh, and aren't buying one house or aren't buying, you know, 10 cars or 10 houses, you're buying one, one car, one house. And so it lets you put your credit history to work for you. Uh, and so I always tell people, let them do that because scores only count them as either one inquiry or none at all. So use them to your advantage. Uh, one other one I'll hit on that's really important is a, a kind of a, a sad one. It, it's divorce and credit. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm probably more often asked about that than anything else. You know, people want to know uh, if my divorce degree says I'm not responsible, doesn't that protect my credit report and doesn't it remove my responsibility for those accounts? And the answer is it doesn't. A uh, divorce decree is an agreement between the divorcing couple and the court. It doesn't break the contracts you have with your lenders. Mm -hmm. And so you need to work with those lenders to have them agree to change the contract. If they don't, you're still responsible for that debt. And if it's not paid, it's going to hurt your credit. So um, really tough one uh, and really tough time in life. But understand that the divorce decree doesn't break those contracts. And so you need to work together as hard as that can be uh, to make sure that you're protecting your credit histories through that process. Got it. Very insightful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so how often should people check their credit score and report? <laughs> Yeah, you know, you should check your credit report at a minimum once a year. You should know what's in it, make sure everything's reported accurately, completely, that there are no signs of fraud. Uh, I always recommend that if you are applying for a, a large credit purchase, a new car or a house, for example, check the credit report at least three months in advance, better six months and even further. Uh, might be a good time to uh, enroll in a credit monitoring service so that you can check your credit report, especially if you're working to improve those scores, you want to check it more often. Uh, and a monitoring service like you would get from Experian, for example, gives you loan payoff tools. It gives you access to your credit report and score, gives you the risk factors that describe what you need to do to make that score better. And so it can help you improve over time. So minimum once a year, at least three to six months prior to making a major purchase. If you've been a victim of fraud, even more often, uh, you can get your credit report free through annualcreditreport.com once a week right now. Uh, don't know that you want to look at it that often. Things aren't updated that <laughs> frequently generally, yeah. but yeah. if you're really concerned, you can do that. Okay. Cool. 70, not 70, 34% of Americans found at least one error in their credit report, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, what's the best way? How do you go about fixing the errors? Mm -hmm. uh, one, I would say that you probably won't find errors um, in the in the studies I see, and there was a, a bigger one recently, uh, and they reference identifying information and the variations listed as errors. Those are not errors. Uh, so um, you know, look at the data uh, and what they're what they're saying are errors, and I think the number is lower than you typically see. It's not perfect. Um, but it's considerably lower. So if you see a name variation, uh, a name spelling, if you see a, a, a listing of variations for social security numbers uh, or street addresses, we list all of those because they could be an indicator of fraud. We want you to see them. We don't want to guess and take the wrong one off. So if those are errors uh, are listed as errors, they're not. Um, they're there on purpose. Uh, so we, we're going to show all of that just to, as a, a point of, of clarity. Yep. Uh, and you can dispute information. If you do find something you believe is inaccurate, we, we encourage you to dispute that information. It's really easy to do. You just go to experian.com slash dispute. If you have a current copy of your personal credit report, not one from a lender, but your personal report, you'll have a an account a report number. Simply enter that number. The report will pop up. It's a secured encrypted system. If you don't have a, a report, we'll ask for some information. We'll give you a free one in addition to all of the other free ones you can get. And click the button next to what you need to dispute. It's like a shopping cart. When you finish disputing information, you hit submit. We give you verification along the way. So you have that paper trail. And 
from there, well, it goes directly to the source of, of the information or the sources. They are then required by federal law, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, to check their records and then respond to us. The options are the information should remain as reported. It should be updated in some way, not always in the way that perhaps the person's disputing the information. It might be a change in the account information. It might be exactly as they disputed or to remove the information. And we'll do that. It, the law says that we have to allow 30 to 45 days. Uh, that goes back to when we mailed things back and forth. Occasionally that still happens, but very rarely. Most of the time disputes are completed in 10 to 14 business days often two to three business days. Oh, wow, it's uh, quick. So, yeah, it's quick. Uh, and because it's auto- it's largely automated, we're able to transmit things se- securely and through encrypted systems. If you have documentation you want to provide, you can upload it to us. We'll send all of that information to the source to consider as part of that dispute as well. And then they come back to us and, and give us the results of, their dis- of the uh, dispute. We will notify you as the consumer of those results. And if you disagree... We encourage you to have what we call a statement of dispute to the to the credit history. Uh, a statement of dispute says, "I disagree with the results, and here's why." It lets you tell tell us exactly why you disagree and, and provide your side of, of the story. Anytime your report is accessed or requested, when uh, that dis, that statement is there, we will notify the entity asking for the report that it is there, and they should respond to that. They'll be aware of it. Uh, so really straightforward, re- easy to do. Uh, and the report you get from us is really easy to read and understand. It's not in, not in a coded kind of fashion. And you see everything that a lender would see, plus some information, particularly those soft inquiries that lenders don't get. Okay. Gotcha. Good. Okay. That's yeah. super helpful. Um, million of Americans are considered credit invisible, meaning they don't have a credit history, which we touched on before. What needs to be done to help reach these people that don't have credit? Uh, Part of it is innovation in our industry, you know, Mm -hmm. figuring out how we help people connect with us. Uh, And Experian, as I mentioned, just has recently launched Experian Go. Uh, It's a service that's part of our free app. You can download our app on your mobile device. And if you don't have a credit history, we'll help you create one right on the spot. Uh, And people don't think about the importance of a credit report beyond you know, things like getting a credit card or a car loan. We, those things are pretty natural. But it's also important for getting a new apartment. Uh, it can save yep. you money on your security deposit. It can yep. qualify you for lower cost, uh, getting utility service, getting a new cell phone. Um, you know, all of those things are now part of your financial life and a credit report can be part of that process. Gotcha. Um, as we talked about getting a job, uh, potentially not the credit score, but the credit report. Yep. And so having a, a, a credit report established is one of the critical components to being financially successful and being financially healthy. Uh, and that's what we want to do is really empower people and, and empower everyone to be more financially successful. And, and, and so our industry has a, a part of that. Um, knowledge, education is a really critical yep. component. Yep. Um, you know, having the knowledge to know that you need to check a credit report and know what's in it and manage it uh, is really essential too. Uh, and I think that needs to start in schools. I, you know, it starts at home, of course, uh, but I always I always use my parents who were, um, I love them dearly, uh, but <laughs> not the best at finance. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, learning from an objective source uh, in our schools can be really powerful. And we know that when kids learn, so do their parents. So it, it goes both ways. Yeah. Uh, and so more education schools, uh, but it's a lifelong long process. And, and you know, I think we have to make ourselves available uh, being on programs like yours uh, and yeah. making more yes. people aware uh, well, I was is, just is really think, critical. And you brought up an interesting point when I was talking about those staggering numbers earlier about people who can't cover emergency bills. We're talking about adults here. And, yep. and, and if they're having problems, then that means that there's a good chance that's not, that's not trickling, trickling down. Mm-hmm. 
you talked a little about this earlier. I just want to touch on one point. Um, negotiating with your credit card companies uh, for a lower rate is a good way that consumers can be proactive. You talk about uh, reducing car insurance costs and how Experian is doing that. Are there any other maybe things that consumers might not know about? Like, hey, you can really do this to to save. I know you talked about the gift cards to buy the boat. I didn't know if there was anything else you wanted to add there. Yeah, I think, you know, coupons, uh, of course. Uh, yeah. I drive my wife crazy because I, <laughs> I don't do the coupon thing, and she does. <laughs> so uh, she's always, she, she will give me, go, go get your haircut, here's a coupon. I'm like, oh, just get my haircut. Yeah. But okay, you know, coupons are, are powerful uh, tools. Um, you know, using your credit history to your advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, being able to, to negotiate and renegotiate. Uh, in some states, things like uh, utilities are competitive. Uh, and so you should revisit uh, again in, in Texas. We revisit our electric cost uh, and providers every year and make them compete for our business. Uh, and we typically save every year mm -hmm. and keep our costs down. So be aware of, of where all of your expenses are going. Utility service, credit cards, um, even today, and, and this is a, a bit of a shocking one for me still, is that auto loans can be refinanced because mm. you know, you're talking about auto loans now that can be, or auto costs of forty or fifty or sixty thousand dollars or more. Uh, I just saw an SUV, a new one that's coming out, and the base price is eighty nine thousand uh, dollars. <laughs> you couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah. So loan terms are getting longer, uh, the costs are getting more. And you, there are companies that can help you refinance your auto loans at a lower yep. rate. Yep. Um, but again, it goes to being able to use that credit history and those, that credit score. Um, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, yep. Call your credit card companies. Uh, talk to your bank. Um, it, those are all valid things you can do to help save costs. Yeah, it's great. I think you answered my next question, but I'll, I'll turn it a little bit. How many Americans do you think, if you asked them on the street, know their credit score? Um, somewhere less than 20%. Yeah. Uh, really wow. would. Wow. Um, you know, off the top of the, off the top of their head. Um, and you know, the, the other thing I would share is, do you know your scores? Because there are lots of credit scores. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, one of the interesting things. Oh, about, interesting. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, the Experian app, if you enroll in the premium service, we give you six or seven different FICO scores. And there's no wow. such thing oh, wow. as the FICO score. Oh, I thought um, there was just one. Wow. Okay. No, there are, there are different scores for different types of lenders. There are different scores for different types of loans. Uh, okay. So, you know, if you think about getting a car loan, they use uh, scores specific to auto lending. They want to figure out, will you pay your car loan on time? If you're buying a house, it's a mortgage loan. They want to make sure that you're, you're going to pay your mortgage loan. Don't care so much about the car loan. Uh, so there's a different score. If you're getting a yep. credit card, they have different score yep. uh, for revolving accounts. Uh, so, um, for example, um, with my scores, uh, from I get the one perk I get at Experian is a, a free monitoring premium monitoring service, and my scores range anywhere from 814 to 890. Uh, so, uh, with a FICO right. auto score, they go to 900 instead of 850. Uh, there are Vantage scores. If you're working with a credit union, there's scores for credit unions. National banks use scores based on their customer relationships and the things that are indicate indicative of risk for their customers. So you have lots of different scores. You only have three credit reports, one from Experian, one from TransUnion, one from Equifax. Mm -hmm. uh, so the thing I always tell people is your credit report is what's really important. If you take care of your credit report, you're going to have good credit scores, no matter which ones are used. A credit score is nice to know. Mm -hmm because it gives you a sense of where you stand in terms of risk. Uh, the risk factors that go with the credit score are what are really powerful for improving it. The thing people don't know, and I was, the, the big secret about credit scores is there's no real secret. You know, Hannah mentioned earlier that, you know, we, we, I've said that you know, boring and consistent is really the key. Um, yeah. You know, what I think I've said is lenders find boring and consistent really sexy yeah. because that means there's no surprises. <laughs> they don't like surprises. Um, same thing's true. And that's what it really is about credit scores. It's about paying the bills on time every single time, keeping your balances as low as possible, knowing that every time a credit score is calculated, a series of risk factors are generated that tell you what from your score or from, from what from your report most affected that score. Yep. The numbers can be wildly different. The risk factors are very, very consistent. And so if you address the risk factors from one score, you're going to make all of them better. And I will say industry um, 
I know the financial industry can take some criticism, but I think the industry has gotten really good at uh, raising credit score awareness. I mean, I even see with my own credit card bills, I get those alerts, check your credit score now. I didn't see that five, 10 years ago, yeah. you know, so no. that's good. All right, Anna, thanks. Cool. On the Couple theme more of financial education, um, seven states currently mandate personal finance being taught in high school um, graduating requirement, and currently there are 43 bills in 21 states to mandate that schools teach financial literacy as their own courses. Um, tell us what your thoughts are on this. Should schools be yeah. teaching this? How's the best way to do it? I'll give you the short answer first. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the long answer <laughs> I figured is... I you would say that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, now, now, the long you, answer is yes. When you say yes, Go ahead. you say yes as in it should be mandated? It should, I think it should be required in our public schools. Yeah, um, okay, good. You know, we talk about all of the, it, it's, the, the detractors will say that you won't remember what you learned uh, in two or three years. Well, we don't really have long, uh, you know, longitudinal studies that show that what we've seen actually is the reverse. People do remember, hey, there's something I need to know. And yeah. by that argument, I should have just skipped school generally um, because I, trigonometry, I don't remember any of that. Um, still may use it, but with personal finance, we all have credit cards in our wallet, in our wallets, in our purses. We all have debit cards. We all have to have insurance. We all are trying to invest to save for retirement. It's something we use almost every single day, yep. and so we need to understand that basic life skill. Uh, so I think we should. Um, Experian was a founding partner of the Jumpstart Coalition for Financial Literacy sure. no, well. more than 25 years ago, um, 20 years ago now. And uh, its purpose is to encourage inclusion of financial literacy requirements, financial education in our schools. I think it's really important. Um, you know, there are arguments that can be made that you should learn at home. I think that's true. But I also know that home isn't always the best place for all of us to learn about personal finance. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it's critical. In Florida just passed uh, a requirement for, for a financial education course for graduation, uh, largest state so far to do so. 25 states, 27 states now have some sort of financial education requirement. Uh, not all of them are related to graduation or requirement for graduation or a full course. Um, but I think it's essential. Yeah, I think that's great. Yep, absolutely. All right, absolutely. our final question, Rod. Um, speaking of Jumpstart Coalition and a, an organization I know well, and uh, you bring, bring up a good point. We've been battling this issue. We've been talking about financial education for 20 plus years. We have more resources at our fingertips than we ever had before. Um, it's clearly a, a combined effort from government, from industry, uh, uh, folks like Experian and others. Um, from your vantage point as a financial literacy expert, um, what gaps do we need to still fill? Like what? What? And I, I guess the other way to say, like, what keeps you up at night? You know, I've I've been I've been going to financial literacy summits for ten years, and everybody comes and they talk about the newest, greatest things, and and and, and there's a lot of good stuff going on. But I feel like. In many ways, we got a we got a ways to go, as you say. So, where do we what? How do we cover more miles here? You know, the the thing that I think about the most is that, as you said, there are a lot. There's a lot of stuff going on. I don't think that we're coordinating our efforts well. I hmm. honestly, I have far too many conversations with people saying, "Well, what about our curriculum and what about our particular topic?" Um, instead of saying, "How do we work together yep. to bring the right information?" So we tend to be competitive in a space that shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I think that that concerns me the most. I think if we focus our efforts, um, mm -hmm. don't be quite so um, possessive of our little piece of the puzzle, um, you know, it, and work together more. I think that would be powerful. I think Jumpstart goes a long way toward that. You know, it's not often that I sit at a table with some of the largest banks in the world, for, uh, certainly in the country, mm -hmm. uh, with the credit reporting companies and our competitors, uh, mm -hmm. with our regulators. Uh, you, know, you won't, I don't know how this will be received, but I'll say it anyway. I don't know how often you'll see experience sitting at the table with CFPB and having a cordial conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, But we're able to do that because we share that same commitment uh, around personal finance and financial literacy and working together 
uh, to coordinate our efforts, I think is is critical uh, instead of being um, kind of focused on our own initiatives. I think that's the thing that I struggle with the most is how do we bring our, our skill sets together to help people um, where they need it the most? Let me ask you this. Do you think there should be a national financial education playbook that you know, I, I don't. And I, what I, let me give you an example of what I mean. Like you said, there's a lot of competition in this space. Everybody's got their thing going on. You've got, you know, and there's so much technology out there, so many resources. But is there like one playbook that everybody can sing from? I mean, when we talk about like the pandemic and rolling out vaccines and, you know, it just even things like that, I don't want to get into that. But I mean, I just feel like, should there be one playbook that says this is the United States' financial literacy road to s- successful mm-hmm. being successful? Yeah, and, it, and it, I think it exists yeah. um, it, it, from a, an education perspective. Yeah. Um, the Jumpstart Coalition and the Council for Economic Education, CE, just uh, in the last few months announced the updated version of their financial education standards mm-hmm. uh, for actually K through now college, uh, but K through 12. I think that's a great place to start. Yep. It, it sets a roadmap for what you need to know and at what age. And, and I think. Um, that that playbook exists. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the hard part is getting everybody to play together uh, on on the field, yeah. right? Um, and get to get along in the playground. So uh, you know, I think it exists. I think it gives guidelines and, and direction. Um, I think we're moving in the right direction, and, and we're seeing more and more. And I think the more we see states. Uh, mandating requirements, Mm -hmm. the more we'll move down that path. Yeah. And my final question, I just have to ask you this. Uh, Has the pandemic in any way brought people to the table, made made people think like, hey, we got to, you know, here's the thing, right? The pandemic forced people into economic, you know, how do I say this? It, It brought them in line, so to speak. And the good thing was we still had jobs and we could do our jobs remotely. I think the challenge with financial education in my book is it's hard to be financially savvy in good times. We saw what can happen in really bad times, and it could be worse. Um, has, is there a pandemic response? Have you guys started talking about this as a community? Um, so it's an interesting thing to me. Uh, as adults, yeah. I think it's easier to be financially savvy in hard times than it is in good times. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, true. You, you know, that, that's true. Um, adults... What my experience is that with with adults in particular, you need to reach them at a what I think was a pain point financially. Yeah. Uh, you know that when they're ready to learn and willing to learn and want to listen, when things are good, all bets are off. Generally, you know they're going to do what they want. It's like that. You know we're seeing cards use as things were were improving coming out of the pandemic. You know balances start to go up. People start to spend that retail therapy thing. Yep. Um, but when their hard times hit now, they start to ask the right questions. They want to know what they need to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so from, a, from an adult perspective, uh, education's opportunity is actually in the bad times mm. uh, and where we need to reach the most because that's when people are coming to us. Uh, from the perspective of young people in schools, we have an advantage because they're a captive audience. They don't have any choice. Mm-hmm. And so... We need to take advantage of that too uh, and make sure that they have the information they need. Uh, because I know one of the, one of my teachers in high school, one of the things he told us that I think was probably the most important thing I heard a teacher tell me was, it's not about learning everything and remembering it. It's about knowing you learn something and need to go know where to look for the answer. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and, you know, so when something happens as an adult, knowing, hey, there was something back there in the distant past that I know I'm supposed to know. And the thing I do know is where I need to go to look for the answer now. That's, if we can carry that forward, that's going to be perhaps the most important thing we can do. Yeah, that's great. I once heard there are two problems with money. You either have a you have a lot of it or you don't have any of it. So it's <laughs> it's good. Hey, Rod, listen, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule, sharing your uh, unique perspectives on how to help Americans become financially healthy during very difficult times. Um, I'm Steve Burke. And I'm Hannah Nine. We'll see you next time on Coffee with Closers. A, B, C.
A, always, B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. We're the Pinkston team, and this has been Coffee with Closers. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes and follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Catch us next time. We know you're not busy.